guest, Julian Figueroa. He's the host of Kinetic Finance, and he's going to be talking about how the new creators are really here leading the way to help the world understand Bitcoin. And we need every single person's voice telling the truth out there. And that's something that I got to learn last year. And so that's why I'm a podcaster and I'm so passionate about talking to my audience about Bitcoin and peace and love and all the happy hippie stuff. So please welcome Julian Figueroa to the stage. Test, test. All right. All right. So today my presentation is on the new era of Bitcoin content creators. So for those who don't know me, my name is Julian Figueroa. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube under the name Kinetic Finance. I make a lot of different stuff. I do a live show on Fridays. I do 60 second TikTok breakdowns of Bitcoin concepts and hard money concepts. I'm making documentaries, um, you know, whenever I have the chance. And I'm, I feel like I'm a pretty creative person. I try my best to look at everything through the lens of a filmmaker and how to tell a story through the medium of film in a visual way, in an auditory way. And I came into Bitcoin in 2016, not really finding any of that content really that really inspires me. So I wasn't finding a lot of Bitcoin filmmakers when I got into it. And today there's tons more and it's growing really rapidly. And I want to talk and hopefully inspire some of you out there who have that burning creative passion to pursue this. But ultimately at the end of this presentation, I have a call to action for everyone here. I have a call to action for the viewers of this content, which is basically all of us. If you've ever watched any video on someone talking about Bitcoin, you're part of this. If you're a creator out there, I have some advice. And really importantly, if you're a company out there, I have some advice too about taking risks on the type of people that are now entering the space. All right. So the first thing I want to kind of use to stimulate your ideas here is that creators and artists paint the world. Um, we have Bitcoin wallets. We have architecture. We have all these things that we think are just the product of engineering and mathematics and code and marketing and business plans. But ultimately, what the people see, what we all see is we see the work of the artist at the end. We see whether it's in UI design, whether it's the way that something's explained. Artists paint this world and they give it color. And when I think about, you know, the internet back in the day, just like Bitcoin, it was just a protocol. It had no color. And I think it really was the early pioneers of the internet creating all sorts of weird content that really brought in the waves of tens, hundreds of millions and billions of people to build out the internet to what it is today. So um, what did our first experiences using the internet look like? So the first time when I used the internet, I was, I think, five or six years old. Um, looked a little something like this. So some people in this room might remember Macromedia Flash Player, Flash games on the internet browser at, at lunchtime at school. Some people might remember RuneScape. There was a million dollar homepage. You could buy like 10 pixels. It was very preliminary and very weird. If you go back, you can look at like Google and Amazon, like the websites and how they looked in the 90s. It's just, it's, it's incredible how far we've come from that. Um, but when people thought of the internet, um, this is what they thought of. They didn't think about, you know, the protocol. They didn't think about like HTTP and HTML and all that stuff. They thought of what they saw from the artists. And even some of this stuff looks a little bit wacky to us now, but it is art and it's evolved and it's changed over time. Um, what I think has happened, fast forward to where we are now, is that people have figured out how to build audiences. We evolved into Web 2.0 and everything was run by algorithms. So instead of people emailing each other links to fun stuff, you would have algorithms that pushed content to certain people. And it changed the way that we created because essentially you could sort of figure out what was the most appealing content just based on, you know, what was the most watched video on YouTube that day or week or whatever. And so in my opinion, and, and what I think a lot of people here can relate to is that attention span, now that we have this Pandora's box of content and things that we can consume on the internet, it's expanded infinitely and it's become very competitive due to these different algorithms and gaming them. And as content like this became commodified, on the, on the plus side, it became a viable career for a lot of people. So, you know, I'm, I'm not able to fully supplement my income from what I do, but there's tons of people who are YouTubers now. I think it's like if you have 
around 200,000 subscribers, you can make a decent first world salary if you are putting out videos every single week. And that's amazing, because people are just following their passions. I mean, everyone here watches probably hours of YouTube content or Twitter content per day um, or week. And so now you can create, build an audience, and develop a somewhat reliable income stream. And building a personal brand for yourself because of all the tools we have on the internet, it's never been easier in history. But now there's a catch because there is more than ever to watch. And a lot of it looks like this. Um, you've all seen it. When you look up Bitcoin on YouTube, this is what you get. You don't get dirty coin documentaries. You don't get in-depth journalism. You get this because this is what works in the, in the age of attention, the attention algorithm. And uh, to be perfectly frank, I play a little bit of this too. Um, so there's a twofold problem that kind of emerges from this. I think organic algorithms, uh, they, they do promote clickbait and high retention content, but most people are not making a living just off the views of their videos and the ad revenue. They're making a living off of the people who sponsor them. And so the, the gatekeepers to the viability of having a career as an artist or a creator on the internet is these advertisers and marketers. And their priority is to work with creators that are good at the algorithm. So you've seen you know, Mr. Beast, you've seen all these thumbnails. You know what it looks like when you go on your YouTube homepage. It looks like a lot of the same type of stuff. And what these advertisers and marketers are looking for is they're looking for your KPI metrics. They want to see you know, what is your turnover rate when you refer a link to another product or company. How many subscribers do you have? What is the average view per video? So they're always looking at these metrics and basically they're going for the biggest creators in whatever said niche appeals to you know, that product. Um, what happens in that, in that situation is that a lot of the people up and coming or a lot of the people experimenting, a lot of the people trying in new niches can't really get found by these advertisers and marketers because they simply are only looking at the highest traffic areas. Um, and so I like to think today, if you know, Leonardo da Vinci was around and William Shakespeare was around, uh, in order for their work to get seen, they wouldn't be able to go to an art gallery and, and put something up or have someone tell you about it. They would be competing with millions of people creating very similar stuff, and they would have to play the same game. So you got Leonardo da Vinci would probably be live streaming his painting today if he was alive. Uh, you know, Shakespeare would be you know, live vlogging himself like, a, like an idiot. Um, because that's just what we have to do as creators. We've, we've, because there's so much competition out there on the internet and attention is, is so scarce now because of that, you have to become not only just an artist, but you have to become your own marketer as well. Um, and the reality is, is I could sit here and stand here and complain about this all day long, um, but the attention economy isn't going away tomorrow the same way that fiat isn't going away tomorrow. And you can draw a big parallel between you know, high time preference and watching clickbait material and low time preference and watching longer material, more thoughtful stuff and being a part of that. Um, but the cold hard truth is if you are like me and you're sick and tired of watching this bland, uninspired content, um, we all have a role to play to break out of that mold. And so in my opinion, we need to be more, more proactive as a viewer or consumer of this content. As creators, we have to listen better to our audiences and see what they want and also follow what re we really want as well. And the sponsors who play a really big role in funding these artists and making their career paths viable uh, also have to be willing to take more risks as well. And so without further ado, um, oh sorry, one more part here. Uh, how does Bitcoin fix this? I can't do a presentation on, on creating and not talk about Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin fixes this in some really interesting ways, and I'm gonna share some stats on how it's really impacted me as of late. Um, number one, I don't know how many people, how many, can you raise your hand if you're on Noster? Awesome, wow, okay. I wanna see this whole room by next year, but it is an amazing place if you're looking to create content. Um, because there's no other platform on Earth where you can do micropayments through clicking the like button. So right now, um, you know, I know Damas, which is like the biggest client on Apple, they banned you from zapping accounts, but there's even these workaround plugins that you can install through backend wallets where you can just hit like the, uh, the hang 10 emoji on any post in the Nostra client and it will instantly send 100 sats or whatever. Um, Bitcoin enables this. There's no other cryptocurrency that's pursuing this. There's no fiat on-ramp that allows 
that quick of a transmission of fully settled uh, money to a creator, which is really cool. Um, there's also no barrier to entry based on region or demographic. A lot of people don't know this, but in order to actually make any money as a creator, a lot of these platforms have minimum barriers of entry. So on YouTube, it requires at least 4,000 hours of watch time and 1,000 subscribers to monetize content. I was putting stuff out weekly for almost two years, spending about 20 hours a week in order to build up enough of that audience. And even today, I'm lucky to make about $30 a month in ad revenue, and I'm, I'm pumping out videos three, sometimes four times a week. Um, so that's not really viable. So again, it falls a lot on the sponsors to kind of help keep these things going. Um, the other thing that Bitcoin does is it offers another revenue source. As a creator, again, you can't rely on just ad revenue. You can't rely on just sponsors. A lot of people here have merchandise. I can see Paco in the audience. Uh, he's got his own shirts. I'll probably do shirts at some point too. But you kind of have to, you kind of have to have a bit of a hustle as a creator to really make enough income. And so. Being able to use Bitcoin through these platforms, uh, whether it's Geyser to do fundraising out in the open, whether it's Noster through the Zaps, creates a whole other stream of income which allows creators to pursue their passions. And just to give you some data on this, um, I've been posting my shorts. You might have seen my 60 second shorts on Bitcoin or whatever. Um, I receive about six to eight dollars, about 18,000 sats per video post. And I only have around 1,000 followers on Noster. They're all hardcore Bitcoiners. But the math is like this, if only 2%, you know, two out of every thousand of those followers send me 38 cents per post that I make, I make $64 a month. Now that's maybe not much to a Canadian or American, but that's a lot if you're maybe in El Salvador or Guatemala or one of these countries. And again, on, on a very small follower count relative to what, you know, a regular creator might have. So barrier to entry gets lowered. Um, Lower time preference too. I think as Bitcoiners, we really we want to see a beautiful, bright future. We're we're anti clickbait by nature. We want to see a return to beautiful architecture, beautiful build quality, and I think that goes with content as well. And luckily, one of the things I've been seeing as a content creator is that I think people are uh, making a flight to quality over quantity. I remember daily vlogging used to be a thing on YouTube. Everyone would post their daily vlogs and now people are cutting back. Mr. Beast only gets a video out every two weeks now. He used to do them every two days. Uh, so there is already a flight to quality over quantity just because of creator burnout. But Bitcoiners um, have a really important role to play in this as well because they demand high quality in all facets. They're the best criticizers. One of the reasons I went to film school and I didn't like it is because in film school, nobody will tell you your film is shit. Everyone will tell you, oh, it's a great script. Maybe I would fix this. Bitcoiners tell me when my videos are crap. They tell me when my research is bad. And I appreciate that. And I think all creators should be open to that. Um, and you know, Bitcoiners also understand that the only thing more scarce than the 21 million Bitcoin limit is the amount of time that you have. So Bitcoiners are very good at picking out people's content that just wastes time. And they prioritize people who are concise to the point, high signal, low noise ratio. And most importantly, in my opinion, Bitcoiners want the truth. We all like to create Bitcoin, you know, propaganda, you know, pump numbers. I think Bitcoin's going to three million or whatever. But ultimately, we want the truth and we want realness from the stories that we tell. There's a lot of stories about circular economies out there, and I think in the beginning, a lot of them were either this is all, you know, a disaster, it doesn't work, and then on the other end of the spectrum, it was like this is the most amazing thing ever. This Bitcoin circular economy, everyone's getting paid in Bitcoin, and, and neither of those stories are true. And I think what I've seen from a lot of creators is people are getting really real about where Bitcoin adoption is today. And Bitcoiners are pursuing the truth. We want Bitcoin to succeed, but we want to tell you know, real, raw, honest stories about where we are in the world. Um, I hope I don't run over. Uh, so in the last uh, 11 years of Bitcoin's life, if you've consumed any Bitcoin content, it's been one of these. It's been tutorials, it's been coming to conferences, it's been podcasts, it's been books, it's been you know, price analysts, TA gurus on, on YouTube, and it's been news shows and news coverage. All of these, in my opinion, I think are really important for us to keep producing and to keep learning from and to keep sharing with others on their orange pill journey, but it's not colorful enough. It's not going to get a whole new generation of people into Bitcoin. We really have to start taking a lot more risks in the stuff that we create. And luckily, I've started noticing this in the last two years. Um, 2021, I'm making 60 second shorts. There's other great creators making 60 second shorts. Paco's in the audience, I'm gonna keep calling on him here. 
Uh, he's doing adventure vlogs, Max DeMarco doing documentaries, people doing comedy sketches and shows, explaining Bitcoin through comedy and parodies, uh, people making Bitcoin-based video games, telling the story of Bitcoin through like 8-bit video games, street interview content. Uh, people, I, I met a guy in, in um, Los Angeles who's making a whole fictional film about an executor of a will, and it has to do with Bitcoin. People doing social experiments, giving out Bitcoin on the street, stuff like that, and then even collaborating with other large influencers to kind of bring Bitcoin into their audiences and world. And as obvious as Bitcoin seems to us, um, people are not rational decision makers, and that's why we need this sort of content. People are emotional. You can show people you know, the, the graph of the US dollar purchasing power over 100 years, but that's just not gonna move people. Uh, storytelling in the Bitcoin space has to adapt or we're going to lose the war against better funded mainstream fear driven storytelling. Um, Greenpeace USA spent $100,000 on this artist to make this and you know, us being Bitcoiners we co-opted it, we made us our own meme. I can't remember the last time a single Bitcoin company, of which there are many and some of them even here, well funded, have ever spent $100,000 on a piece of art or an art project like that. And then the crypto companies too, they're willing to take the risk to invest in these Shark Tank knockoffs, right? Um, we might never watch it, we might think it's trash, but they're going out there and these shows, whether we like it or not, are becoming part of the culture because they're going out there, they're replicating existing things, and they're trying something new in the crypto space and they're bringing in people that way. Um, and I, I hear a lot of excuses, I talk to Bitcoin companies all the time. Oh, but they have money from the fiat machine. You know, we would spend more money on Bitcoin creators, but it's a bear market. We've got to pinch every sat. Oh, we're not sure it's worth the investment. We don't know how many signups or, you know, referrals we're going to get from it. And what I have to say to that is no more excuses. We don't have time to wait for number to go up once every four years and to have a marketing budget. We can just, you know, splurge on things. This has to be a part of every Bitcoin company because ultimately you guys have the capital to fund and make these projects come true. And people want to see it. And I think I'm an example of this. I've been making really outside the box content. People have come to it and shared it. And it's, it's really blown me away how many people have connected with it. And I think it's just because there's just a lack of this stuff out there right now. Um, so uh, I'll try and wrap this up in three minutes. I have 21 ways to make beautiful Bitcoin content. Uh, piece of advice, seven for the viewers, seven for creators, and seven for companies and donors. Uh, for viewers, seek out beautiful work. Break your routine. You listen to a podcast every week, or you, you, know, you only follow like six or seven people on Twitter to get your information. Break your routine, try and find other people. One of the best things about the Bitcoin space, which goes into number two, is that people do elevate smaller voices in this space, and I encourage you to do that too. If you see a small content creator, 100 followers, but you, you just generally like what they're doing, share it. It makes a massive impact. Comment and engage with the material too. Help the algorithm or whatever. Uh, contribute, whether it's Noster, whether it's buying a piece of merch from one of these creators, every penny helps with this stuff because we're all risking our lives to do this without really being certain of the outcome of if, if we can make it a viable career. Consume intelligently, don't waste your own time. I know it's very easy to you know, sit and watch price hopium and euphoria all day and kind of reinforce existing biases, but consume stuff that challenges your beliefs. Um, you know, there's a lot of Bitcoiners in the space that don't all agree with each other, and I think it's important that we seek that content out too. Be a critic. If you're following someone, you like what they're doing, um, engage with them, and yes, we do read all your comments, um, especially Maybe a couple of the people who have a million followers don't read the comments, but you can go to any big Bitcoin creator and you can ask them, and trust me, they, they look at everything. And last one, which is really important, don't be afraid to create yourself. I know some people are afraid to get out on a stage or to make a video themselves or to write things. Don't be afraid and feel free to ask creators anything too about that journey because we're going to share that story either way. Uh, for creators, I'm gonna run over just a little bit, but not too much. Um, be patient and stay solvent. This was the biggest thing for me in the beginning is I didn't go guns blazing on this because I wasn't sure where I was gonna end up. And I think it's important to put 100% of your effort into creating content to have a vision of what you want. But you have to stay solvent because it does take a lot of iteration and time to actually get to you know, a content routine or to, to create half decent stuff. It took me a really long time to get more comfortable on camera, to want to be on stage. And you can go back to my YouTube channel or even my shorts and look at my old stuff and you can see I was uncomfortable. I just, I didn't quite find my flow yet. It takes years 
to really find your flow state and for people to really connect with whatever that is for you. Um, number two, and this is really important, always have big goals and dream projects. This is the advice that they give to screenwriters and to people in Hollywood. Always have a script you can pitch because you never know who you're going to meet who might like some of your old stuff and say, hey, how can I fund what you're doing in the future? Do you have any upcoming projects? Always have some type of crazy big goal that you can pitch to someone because you just never know, and especially in bull markets, the capital can come really quickly. Um, number three, equipment doesn't matter. Uh, as long as people can hear you and see you, you can grow. You don't need to have all this fancy film equipment. Uh, take risks in the stuff that you make, but keep a routine. So whether it's once a week, once every two weeks, every day, figure out what you can manage and you can play around with the type of stuff that you put out in that time frame, but be consistent with it. Um, number five, don't tread alone. You don't have to be alone on this journey creating content. Elevate others in the process. If you find yourself in a group of other creators, it's one of the best ways to stay encouraged to keep making stuff. Um, number six, remember why. Always ask yourself at the end of every week, why are you actually doing this? Is your goal to orange pill everyone? Do you want to just orange pill one specific person? What is your North Star? Always keep that in mind. It can change, but have a why for what you're doing. Um, it makes sure that the stuff that you put out there is really your best work. And number seven, be you. Bitcoiners can spot fakes pretty easily, but challenge yourself and be uncomfortable on camera. I have this shirt from one of my favorite YouTube channels. It says, seek discomfort, and I live by that model. I'm always trying to do stuff that makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, all right, lastly, companies and donors, advice for you guys, uh, take more risks. My God, I know how easy it is to sponsor a conference or a podcast, but the stuff that is coming out of these smaller creators has way more reach and way more impact. It's not as easily measurable because they're not putting it out every you know, day or two days or a week, but take more risks because if you do invest in a creator that just blows up all of a sudden, not only will you have a part in creating Bitcoin culture and orange pilling a bunch of people, but that creator too, uh, and this goes into the second point, will become a partner for life for you. I've worked with some Bitcoin companies that when I had like a couple hundred subscribers, they loved what I was doing and I still work and I still talk with them and I was, you know, they were sponsoring me for like $50 a month. And as my stuff goes in the future, I'm going to give them preferred rates on that stuff because they supported me from the very beginning. Uh, so look at creators as partners. Don't look at them as contractors. Don't look at the stuff that they're making as commodities. Look at them as people that you almost have within your organization and treat them like that. I think that's really important to do. Number three, there's more to ROI, return on investment, than money. Um, if, if you're only sponsoring creators so that you can get more signups, that's going to only work for so long. I, I really think that we're moving into the world where people will align with creators and the companies they align with. Um, I can throw a couple names out there like Surfshark VPN, Squarespace, all these companies, they sponsor hundreds and hundreds of YouTubers. They have varying rates. It's not one size fit all. Um, but most importantly, you know all those brands because you've watched a YouTuber plug them at one point. They've built up that loyalty. And to me, that's more important than just the money. Um, have a low time preference. Creators can be part of any part of the sales funnel. They're not just there to push people to a referral link. They can be there to help you get people to sign up for email lists. They can be there to um, you know, help build a tutorial for something. You could even take them within your organization and they can be like a host or a spokesperson. So if you're a marketer in this space, you're a Bitcoin company, don't think it's always like, oh, I gotta just buy a 45 second plug on their channel. Us creators need to do a better job of pitching all the things that we can offer, but look at it like, you know, long-term relationships and different things that you can do in it uh, besides just referral programs, which again, are not one size fits all. And lastly, uh, second to last, beautiful work is priceless. Um, you might see a creator with very few followers, but if you think that person is making beautiful work, you should, you should figure out how much money from your company and your marketing budgets you can allocate towards stuff you know will be beautiful. There are some amazing, amazing creators in this space. I'm going to highlight some of them uh, in the next slide that are not maybe going to generate you a massive ROI if you give them a thousand dollars, but they're going to make something beautiful and you having a chance to be a part of that, I think is priceless. And then number seven, uh, take more fucking risks. Did you really start a business in Bitcoin to sponsor a bunch of podcasters? I don't think so. Uh, so we're changing the world. Take some more goddamn risks. Uh, these are some of my favorite creators. I won't go through all of them. Uh, some of them are in the audience, uh, but please do check them out. They're doing some really cutting edge stuff from comedy shows, travel vlogs, 
um, like everything Spanish language content. I, I just met the Stack Chain magazine guys. Those guys are so interesting. They're, they're creating like the mad magazine of Bitcoin culture, which is just such an interesting idea. Um, check out all these creators. They're doing some really amazing stuff. And uh, I really encourage anyone in this room to sponsor and uh, support them in what they're doing. And lastly, uh, you can find me at Kinetic Finance. Um, my big project that I'm doing, if you're interested in seeing more of my work or funding what I'm doing. In the next four weeks, I'm going down to Peru and I'm making a documentary about um, this uh, nonprofit called Motive, their exploits in building circular economies across dozens of villages in Peru. And we're focusing on some really interesting character pieces of people who have had their, you know, their entire lives changed from Bitcoin. So yeah, that's it. Thanks everyone.